Happy Thursday, everybody. My name is Ellie Timmons, and I am the host of today's podcast. In today's episode, I talk with Michigan State alum Jeffrey Schifra. We talk about his path into wealth management, the firm he works for, and his advice for graduates interested in the career field. Enjoy. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the WMA podcast. My name is Ellie Timmons, and today we have us have joining us Jeffrey Schifra. Jeff joined Clarkson Capital Partners in 2021 to manage private client relationships within the firm. Prior to joining Clarkson, Jeff was a portfolio manager and founding partner of Iron One Investments, senior portfolio manager with Bank of America Private Bank, and manager in the private client service division of Arthur Anderson. Jeff holds a Master of Taxation from Arizona State University and a Bachelor of Arts in Accounting from Michigan State University. So welcome, Jeff, and thank you for being on the podcast. Ellie, thank you for having me. So without further ado, let's get started. Jeff, do you want to kind of start us off by telling us a little bit about yourself and maybe your journey into wealth management? Absolutely. So yeah, I grew up in southeastern Michigan. Um... I am allergic to the cold, which is how I, how I find it myself uh, all the way out to the desert. Um, but I, I, you know, as you mentioned, I went to undergrad at Michigan State. I read a book, I think it was in eighth grade by Peter Lynch, who um, if you're in the investment world, you might know him from his days at Fidelity. He managed a really large mutual fund called um, Fidelity Magellan. And he wrote an impactful book that I read very young that I just, kind of really resonated with me that made me want to be in wealth management slash portfolio management. So I was very fortunate and always have been very fortunate to know at a young age what I kind of wanted to do, um, which was work in the investments field. And I just, for a blue collar guy, always resonated with green green and white. So found myself at Michigan State, had a really amazing experience there. And then uh, my sister lives then and now in Tempe, Arizona. So three straight spring breaks. And as you know, what um, winter can be like in East Lansing, <laughs> I spent uh, three straight spring breaks in Tempe, Arizona, and uh, which pushed me to come out West upon graduation. Uh, and I ended up working with a large big six accounting firm that no longer exists called Arthur Anderson. Uh, in their private client group and was in, in, within that group was required to get a master's in the path of least resistance, which ended up working out for me due to dumb luck, was a master's in taxation. Uh, met some great contacts there. Um, wanted to be more hands-on in investments as I was more of a, in the consultant's role at Anderson, so worked at the Bank of America Private Bank, and then was very, very fortunate to be approached by a large client um, that I shared at both Anderson and B of A that wanted me to manage his portfolio, but wanted me to do it on on a standalone basis. So I had the courage because of one large client to go on my own and did that in 01. So impeccable timing as the market collapsed (laughs) shortly thereafter, Um, but was able to um, cobble together over a period of about 20 years, a little bit over a billion dollars of assets under management. And then I had been speaking for about five years with Jeff Hacklett, Jerry Hacklett, and JJ Modell, who are founding partners at Clarkston. And I had known Jeff and Jerry for over 40 years, just to date myself. We grew up next to each other in in Farmington Hills, Michigan. Um, And they have a really, uh, Clarkston has an excellent investment management firm with two divisions. I specialize more in the private client side and JJ does an excellent job there, but just needed some help. So I pivoted with uh, a couple of my uh, key people at Ironwood, and we brought some of our clients with us and joined uh, a little over two years ago. Time's flying. Wow. So you mentioned you joined in 2021 um, at Clarkson. Can you kind of walk us through your day-to-day or some of the things, you know, 
uh, you manage and just your, your day-to-day work? Yeah, the day-to-day work is, is what's really rewarding for a handful of reasons. First of all, every single day is completely different. Uh, while there's some certainly recurring themes and tasks that um, I'll do or someone in our field will do on a regular basis, it's you know, what I expect to do on a particular day and while I have certain things I want to get accomplished, there's always things that are surfacing. So, you know, our, our day-to-day is just really managing client portfolios and helping them achieve their unique goals and objectives. And I think a lot of people will kind of say the same thing. We just think we do it in a, in a more differentiated way than most of our competitors, including what I used to do for close to two decades. So not being disparaging of, of alternative approaches, but our approach is, is certainly unique for Michigan and even unique, I would say, for the country in that you know we manage relatively concentrated portfolios. So we're, we're known as bottom-up fundamental investors. We try to identify a smaller group of super high quality businesses, which we would define as consistently profitable possess durable competitive advantages to remain that way and is ethically and competently managed. That's a good business. It becomes a good investment when you can buy it on sale with with a margin of safety. So as opposed to owning 500 different investments, we would hold something closer to 50. And so we have a higher level of conviction in each name that we own. Uh, We spend our time, and I don't have to do this personally because we have eight full-time analysts that do that in Rochester. Michigan. Uh, their day-to-day job is to vet and find super, super high quality businesses. And then we wait for them to go on sale. And so my typical day is just implementing client portfolios, speaking with clients, making sure their fact pattern hasn't changed. We do very intentionally simple financial plans. We don't believe complexity is your friend when it comes to financial modeling. It doesn't, it doesn't work. There's a false sense of precision. When you have 4,000 variables, it's impossible to get even five variables correct, much less something beyond 10. So, you know, that's the sort of stuff we do. And we, well, we don't hold ourselves out as, you know, insurance professionals, tax experts, even though we do have a deep tax expertise and estate planners, we try to sort of coordinate all of those disciplines to make sure that we're handling a client holistically and we involve other professionals all the time. So tip, our typical client of ours will have an estate planning attorney, we'll have an accountant, we'll have a life insurance professional to the extent that's even appropriate. And then we sort of quarterback that relationship. And uh, uniquely, I think, to our, our offering is that we, whereas most of our competitors have an open architecture, they can buy anything, any exchange traded fund, any mutual fund, any stock bond, et cetera. We tend to only own individual large cap securities, occasionally mid cap. We, we have three institutionally managed mutual funds that Clarkston manages in house. And then we have a very straightforward, intentionally straightforward fixed income approach to just offset uh, some risk and create some living expense reserves. So and it, I, I being very long winded, I apologize for that, but that's an, a day to day is just sort of managing and spearheading the clients, you know, overall uh, wealth management. And, endeavors. Yeah, and I think it's really unique. So within that, you said, you know, you guys have that unique portfolio. Do you think that draws in a lot of clients? And is it hard to educate clients on that since it is unique? And it's not just your, you know, standard portfolio that a lot of other firms do? It's a great question. And ultimately, what happens is we are very upfront about why we do things our way. Um, like, which again is is typically very concentrated relative to like, buying the S and P 500 and calling it a day. You're going to sort of match the benchmark no matter what. And our, I guess our perspective on that is when you own 500 different th- things, a it's really really difficult to really be an expert on 500 different investments at one time. We would say we 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 know we can't do that. We don't have the resources to do that. But even within say the S and P 500, and of course you could elaborate on the Russell 1000 or the Russell 2500 and keep getting capitalizations that are they're getting even smaller there's just not there's not a lot of great businesses out there uh, from our perspective but in a great business meaning it's in the it's it's growing it's got great management it's got durable competitive advantages to maintain 
consistency and profitability. And of course, nothing's a good investment until you can buy it on sale from our perspective. We, again, we're, we're, we are a value-based manager. We're trying to buy things with a margin of safety. But ultimately, clients will either resonate to owning not the world, but a smaller group of things. And by the way, we would certainly think that if you own 50 different equity investments and 20 different very straightforward, very liquid, very stable, higher credit quality fixed income investments, bonds, that is a well-diversified portfolio. And then we, we would counter that, you know, you can approach something called from Peter Lynch, diversification. You have so many investments that you don't know what you own. And ultimately, you know, while I was very, very captivated and, and seduced by uh, Markowitz's three-factor efficient frontier model back in the 90s uh, when it came, uh, actually his came out in the 60s and uh, Brinson B. Bauer and Hood's study, empirical study came out in, I think, 91 about you can, you know, have expected returns for each asset class, standard deviations around each asset class and correlation coefficients in practice is very different than theory. Every time there is a, a systemic risk to the broader capital markets, the correlations go to one. So all that diversification and you know, talking about having exposure to emerging markets, it, it is not actually beneficial. And you have to experience that for about three decades until you believe it. You don't even believe it your first 10 years. It's the second and third decade that you're like, gosh, this really doesn't provide quite the downside protection that it should. Uh, but what does provide downside protection and what shows up in our performance numbers is just being extremely patient and waiting for super good businesses to go on sale, which does happen. Uh, and sometimes it's it's very temporary and fleeting and very noise driven. But we have identified, we think, a, a large number of really good businesses and we just simply can't buy them as investments until they do sort of meet our, our what our, we would view a minimum threshold of evaluation uh, level that has, again, this, you know, significant margin of safety because the future is unknowable and we can be wrong. And so we want to sort of discombat both of those things. And we're not going to be perfect, even in a relatively concentrated portfolio of 50 different securities. Not every name is going to work out. But by the way, it's not always to the downside. Sometimes you'll have a name that works out rather dramatically to the upside that you didn't think it would. Uh, you thought it would kind of, you know, our minimum threshold for returns are around uh, stated around 10%, and we've achieved better than that. But it's certainly, it's not linear. It's not every year. Life would be nice and smooth if that was the case. But, you know, just if you kind of line up the S&P 500 for the last 100 years, one out of four years is negative. So you're going to have that, you know, behavioral finance combativeness. You have to work with clients to say, hey, listen, this is normal. The world's not ending. It's not ending now. And that, you know, so there's a lot of the hand-holding um, due to the fact that people get emotional about their money and no one likes to see it go down. Uh, and we just, we just have to, you know, educate people that, hey, price noise is not permanent capital impairment. Permanent cap capital impairment is when you buy something at 20 and you actually end up selling it at 10. You've lost 10 bucks. But buying something at 20, having it go to 18 and then retrace to 27, that's the environment and experience we're trying to people you have to be patient to let that happen. And, you know, nothing in, in nature is in bloom all four seasons. And we remind people of the really simple concepts like that, that, hey, we bought this thing because it hemorrhages free cash flow, and we bought it for the next seven years. We, we don't care what happens to it over any one month, three month, or even two year perspective. It, that's irrelevant. When we, you're a long-term investor, you're looking at things over five and seven year cycles, not one and two month cycles. And I bet when you explain it that to clients that way and you pair it with results, I bet it's not very hard to get them on board. <laughs> well, you know, again, it, it's you, you end up being fortunate because you're if you're really upfront about what people should expect and how you, what your process is. And we're definitely a process oriented firm um, because we think that's, you know, you have to have a process. You have to be consistent with it. It's just like if you and I had a knee problem, we went to our, our orthopedic surgeon we hope he does the same thing about every single time when he sees the same fact pattern. And we're, we're the same way. If, you know, we're trying to gather facts on the front end of a relationship, do a very basic financial plan to solve for an equation. If you know you have $4 million and you're trying to spend $100,000 a year, we're trying to develop a portfolio that will 
outpace that withdrawal rate plus an inflation factor plus an, a, 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 an amount for taxes and then we want to um, you know kind of grow the portfolio too no one likes to wake up 20 years from now and not being able to afford the same basket of goods so but if our process and our approach doesn't resonate we would rather up front just wish them well and introduce them to some other firms that we are familiar with and we think that they do a great job too and it just resonates more with they don't want to be out of favor because that is there's some there's a concept called active share and that means how different are you than the benchmark and if we just hypothetically say the benchmark for that statement is the s p 500 our active share is around 99 which means we are nowhere near similar to the s p 500 and when you from that lens, why on earth would our performance be anywhere similar to the S&P 500? We don't look at anything like it. Our composition is such that we have like a one, one, one holding, if you will, that's similar to the S&P 500. So when you're 99% different, your, your return um, returns will be very different. And of course, you would, we would love to be outperforming in both directions, up and down markets, but we tend to outperform rather dramatically in a down market. Um, and if you outperform in a down market, you don't have to climb out of a hole, like say that the index would, and I won't get too granular on performance, but by way of example, if last year, the S&P 500, 2022 was off 18 to 20%, and you had an investment approach that was closer to flat, you didn't lose any money. That really helps someone psychologically to know that, oh, okay, well, you, you actually can execute in a down market. And, and then if the market's up 15 and we're up 12, you know, people can accept that. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. It's all about building that trust too. So being able to show that to clients, I bet makes them feel. Yeah, and, and that takes time, you know, and I, yeah. you know, obviously <laughs> a lot of times, you know, we only grow from uh, referrals from generally happy clients and a relatively small network of, of, of professionals, you know, in the estate planners, et cetera. And, you know, even a, a, a warm referral, if you will, from a client that's been with us for a really long time they don't know us yet so it, it just takes time to build that trust and it takes a couple of different markets up and down for them to see that yeah we can participate in an up market perhaps not dollar for dollar but you know we have a minimum return threshold on the equity side of 10 percent. but in a down market and you know to use a sports analogy we think we play really good defense um and we would rather not prove to that someone right out of the gates because that means we're in a down market but sometimes that's just the way it works out. You know, you have, if you have clients coming in and you're doing this long enough, you just sort of have different vintages of when they came to you. You know, someone that hires you just before the, the expansion of a bull market thinks you're really, really smart. And someone who hires you just at the end of a, a, a bull market might think, well, these guys work really hard, but you know, it's been three months and I've done, I've done nothing but lose money on paper. That of course will change too, if you're with any advisor long enough. Yeah, that makes sense. So now back to, you know, Clarkson Capital. My next question is, how does Clarkson Capital want to support the next generation of advisors? I know this past Friday, they actually had an event with Michigan State University. So can you kind of talk about that and, you we know, did. why they're doing these events with the university? Yeah, so we had an event on Friday at the Rochester office. It was our kind of inaugural um, discussion and the way it worked is we spoke for about an hour and a half on our two different divisions. So Jeff Hakala, uh, the CEO and, and CI, co-CIO of the firm spoke for about 45 minutes on the institutional management aspect of, of the industry. And of course, Clarkston plays in that sandbox as well. We have about $5 billion in institutional management and our relatively concentrated equity strategies. And then I spoke for about 45 minutes and with the caveat that Jeff Hack was a very tough act to follow. Um, but I spoke for about 45 minutes on the private client side and just how diverse that space can be. Um, there's so many different ways and disciplines you can be involved in, in private client. Um, so I touched on that. I touched on our relatively straightforward approach. Um, really just a, a way to uh, give people um, a a look through or maybe a look behind the green curtain to use a Wizard of Oz uh, phrase um, of our industry. And 
we also then invited uh, some of our competitors to join us after for like a happy hour. So we, we had some um, well-regarded professionals that were there uh, from other firms and just so they're kind of a networking event. Um, much to our surprise, we're, we're having a week long boot camp beginning in May and we misjudged, um, uh, I guess it, it, was, it was oversubscribed. So we, we had to cap it uh, next year. We will try to do a much bigger one. Uh, we've hired a handful to, to continue on your, your question, how we tend to sort of support Michigan State. We've, I think at least two recent hires have come from Michigan State. Uh, I think I can mention their name here because they're on the website, Christian Adabong um, was last year's hire. And then Cole Chewens, um, who played left tackle and he's lost about 80 pounds, uh, was hired, <laughs> I think, two years prior. So our, our hope is to continue to make inroads into what we view to be extremely deep talent pool at Michigan State um, within various disciplines, the finance program, accounting program, certainly the wealth management program. And we would not, you know, shy away from someone with an econ degree or a statistics degree. So we, we, we would, we, several of the partners, you know, have degrees from Michigan State. We have great working relationship with the university. We'd, we'd like to build upon that within the students themselves, because ultimately we're trying to identify professionals that are young that can manage our money in 20 years and do so at Clarkston. Uh, so that's our objective. And so you've seen, I mean, with your recent hires and these events, you've seen the college students, what kind of recommendations would you give them if they are wanting to break into this field? Um, I would say, you know, really basic stuff, like be personable, <laughs> you know, it doesn't cost anything to be nice and friendly. I would say I have my own, you know, uh, rules. Like I get back to someone the same day uh, it's just like would say, doesn't, I don't need 15 minute response times, but even if I'm traveling on the road, cause we have a national footprint of clients, I get back to someone the same day. And sometimes it's just to let them know, Hey, I've, I've got your message. I'm traveling. I will get back to you within 48 hours. And if it's, it's more urgent than that, you know, please get a hold of William Lee, who is another senior professional here. And William and I rarely travel together. So we have an approach where if, he, if I'm on the road, he's here, vice versa. Uh, I would also say be a voracious reader. I read every day for at least an hour and a half um, still. So you're all, we, we're, we come from an environment at Clarkson and we foster it's, it's a, we're always trying to learn more. We strive ourselves on being the most knowledgeable shareholder of our investments. So just be a voracious reader. And I would say have like, especially if you want to be in like private client or wealth management, have a deep tax background which can be self-taught incidentally. You don't have to get a CPA or have a master's in tax, but just reading some articles on, you know, what a, what a, a private foundation is and why you might want to consider one for a wealthy client, just very basic things. If you just read, read a handful of articles on something, you'll probably know more than most people, even that are considered experts in investments. Uh, you can have a little bit of tax expertise uh, in the government. Of course, I'm approaching this from my own lens because I have that, uh, but it's worked, you know, well for me to when I'm competing with a, with a, a you know, a formidable competitor for uh, a relationship, we can always lean on the fact that, hey, you know, we don't have thousands and thousands of clients here. We, you know, we have a higher client minimum so we can spend more time with someone. And by the way, everything we do is tax focused. That tends to resonate with a lot of our client base when, all of our clients are very patriotic, but not when it comes to paying taxes. Yeah. <laughs> Funny how that works, right? <laughs> so you've been, you knew what you wanted to do since eighth grade, like you said. In the yes. Day. Yeah. Very fortunate for that. For Yes, you are. <laughs> how have you seen the industry change, um, you know, throughout your career so far? I, honestly, the to me, the what used to take, I can remember doing financial plans at Arthur Anderson. And it would, you know, take me on warning to sort of load in the information, which was acquired after a series of meetings with a client. We didn't have formal intake forms. We had a mental checklist and we would just kind of gather information. I would enter the data and then I'd press a button and I'd go to lunch for about an hour and a half and I'd come back and the, the, the calculations were still grinding. So to me, the, 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 what's available at our fingertips today, the software, the internet is just, it's game changing how quickly 
that we can do things and just having a kind of a robust integrated uh, CRM client relationship management tool that is a, either layered on or somehow integrated with a portfolio management software system. It's to me, the biggest change I've observed over three decades is just how robust the software is that's out there. Um, not that, not that profound of a statement, but nonetheless, that's, that's my, my, my answer. No, I agree. When I interned this past summer, I was just shocked at how many programs there are and the new ones that are just coming, you know, month after month. It was, it, it was, it was crazy. Um, and that's just going to continue to grow. That's for sure. For, for sure. For sure. If you don't embrace technology, you're going to be left behind. Yeah. So with that being said, what kind of makes you excited about the future of the field you're in? What, what are you going to be excited for in the next five to 10 years? Uh, good question. I think that the, you know, what I can't even imagine today, I know will present itself in the not too distant future. So I think the continual advances um, in, in really artificial intelligence and software and how that will really allow us to serve clients uh, in, a, in a more optimal fashion and certainly efficient fashion and quicker fashion is very interesting. And just to me, the day-to-day -day, um, blocking and tackling of this industry is you're, all, you're working with just a, a wide spectrum of uh, really interesting people. Um, and the vast majority of them, but not all, but the vast majority really appreciate the partnership. And I learn from someone every single day. And I, I like to try to take those nuggets of data and information and use them in the future. And so it's a, this, the, it's very rewarding to a, a help people achieve their goals and objectives and then B be constantly learning uh, from people that, again, it might have nothing to do with investments, but you just, you learn about how they approach something and how they solve problems and how they ask questions in a diplomatic way. And you, you if you're a sponge, like I hope to be, um, you're, you're sort of improving yourself and then helping the teammates around you, um, you know, sort of leverage the things that you've learned. And sometimes experience is just making a lot of mistakes over three decades. Mm -hmm and being humble enough to acknowledge that, hey, I didn't do that right, and I need to approach it differently next time. And you know, we, we sort of do post-mortems on our, even our investments that don't quite work out. You know, We have a minimum threshold of 10, and we had something that returned 8%. We want to explore what, what, how we fell short, or what, what was different about what actually happened versus our investment thesis. And if you're constantly trying to improve, um, which we are, that's what to me is exciting, is that every day we don't just, you know, success is never final and failure is never fatal. And we understand that that rent is never owned, it's it's earned every single day. And that's what we all work very hard to A, accomplish our goals and objectives for our clients and then B, just be constantly learning. And if we're doing that, we think we're certainly continue, gonna continue to move in the right direction. Yeah, and I think that's something that's always intrigued me to this career too, is, you know, as things change, you're learning too. You're always, you know, getting better as you know a person as an advisor so as we wrap up i wanted to ask any final parting words or words of advice um for students looking into this career uh you know just believe in yourself i think that that's a, you know even though you don't have quite the expertise no one on my side of the table is going to expect you to know anything mm -hmm. um right out of school so but if you have a you know a positive attitude and you're pleasant and you have good response uh, that's just believe in yourself work hard and it's 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 a absolutely a marathon and not just not a sprint and the world doesn't end very often so if you have a setback at work or it, it, it's okay you know that's going to happen it happens to everyone every single day it's just you know being sort of resilient is what i think um most people if they can just be resilient they'll be end up being successful just by the sheer passage of time Thanks, Jeff. I will today I've loved learning about your path, a little bit about Clarkson and that advice you gave students. So thank you so much for being on. And we're so appreciative of your words of advice. Ellie, my absolute pleasure and uh, best of luck at GM. Thank you so much. If you like what you just heard, please like, comment and share. This is Lance Mullen, producer of the MSU WMA podcast. MSU WMA or Michigan State University Wealth Management Association is a student organization part of the Eli Broad College of Business located in East Lansing, Michigan. Our mission is to inspire and educate the next generation of financial planners. Thank you for listening to today's episode. 
If you enjoyed, please check out our channel on all platforms such as Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And check out our social media at MSUWMA and MSUWMA.com.